when you meet weakness. You can easily recognize it just by the facial expression, the words, the way they walk. You can recognize weakness because all you have to do is remember what you are like. So when meeting weakness, pretense, you always have a bag of tricks ready to handle it. Handling it, of course, according to your own self-interest. You meet someone who's a little bit apologetic, a little bit fawning, and the neurotic parts of you immediately leap up and grab the proper sarcastic remark, the sneer, whatever. So you're, you're delighted, pleased, you feel like somebody, you're powerful, you're in charge when you meet a weak man or a weak woman. It makes you feel as if your world is okay temporarily, that things are going your way. Look how vicious you are. You keep your phony world in place at the expense of making another person cry, of making them feel bad, of putting them in a state of fear. You can, you're looking at their face and you know, gentlemen, but you're not very gentlemanly, come to think of it, men, you know when you make that woman cry, you know you're causing her great fear and anxiety and tension. And since you're no real man at all, can you imagine what kind of a human being you are? to take pleasure in making her cry. So you gentlemen know how to handle weakness in a woman. And shame on you, you take advantage of it to the maximum, subtly and openly. And all the time, you don't know what a monster you really are. You don't, I swear to you, Men, you don't know what a monster and human disguise you are. The same goes for the ladies in their own way. You can be just as vicious. The point being, we know what to do with the weakness in the world, which, as always, when we run into any kind of a situation, we seek to exploit it, to make it work for us, no matter what it is, the dominating question in our mind is, what can I get out of this? How can I feel powerful, assured? How can I get comfort? How can I feel that I'm in the right by making you in the wrong? What poison can I get out of the situation to drink? But we never call it poison. We call it pure water, of course. I have said about three times now, you know how to handle weakness in this world. You know what to do with it for your own sick benefits. And you're all sickies, every one of you here, every one of you. I don't know which one is the worst than the next one. That is your triumph. That is your victory some victory. Aren't you proud of yourself that you have the power, the authority, the opportunity, and the wish to make someone cry, to hurt them? Aren't you proud of yourself for what you're doing to everyone you meet, whether you say a word to them or not? Your own fearful manner, your own fearful face is making them afraid. You don't even know what you're doing on that level to say nothing of the overt one where you're saying something. You don't know that you're very, your, your own fearful, cowardly manner 
is transmitting itself out to the world. They are reading it in your face and the very fact that you're scared, and which you don't call fear, of course, makes them scared and you get pleasure out of it. The pleasure you get from making another person afraid proves that you yourself are living in great terror. Otherwise you wouldn't feed on their fear because fear feeds on producing, reproducing more of itself. So are you proud of yourself? I'm asking you a question. Please uh, participate in the meeting with me. You proud of yourself for hitting that woman physically? Hitting her verbally? You ladies, proud of yourself for being able to exploit men? You know by the telephone call, by the letter, by their manner, what they want from you? And your little cunning goes into operation. I know what he wants. What can I get out of it, whether I give him what he wants or not? Proud of yourselves, ladies, for your cunning, working men like that? Okay. You know what to do with weakness in the world. Ah, now we come to something else. Utterly baffling. Utterly puzzling. And I see it in this room all the time. I saw it in several instances last night. What do I do with strength? On those very, very rare occasions when I see it. How do I react? You don't know how to react. This is different. There's not, no one to pounce on and you sense that. And yet, you'll pounce on the strength if you catch a glimpse of it, if it really is strength, and it's very complex, you'll pounce on that, shaking and trembling, knowing that you are doing wrong, and yet be unable to help yourself because you're so utterly sick, that's all. Why should I go into detail? Oh, I'll go into a little detail. I just thought of a good word. I wish, uh, yeah, the word is degenerate. Because you're such a degenerate, your old degenerate habits of pouncing on weakness have no choice but to continue in their mechanical flow to attack strength if you dimly begin to recognize it. And the, I apologize for calling you degenerates. And the reason I did that is because I couldn't think of a lower word. If you can help me on that, write it down on a piece of paper and I'll use it next time. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not insulting you. You're degenerate. You don't know what it means. To be degenerate means to want to destroy the whole world for the sake of your own sickness in order to try to vainly prove that your sickness is not help. Would you agree that's a pretty good word? Hmm? If you can think of a worse one, I'd appreciate it if you give it to me after the meeting. So you encounter strength. Now, what is strength? Real strength is nothing more than truth, cosmic consciousness. It can appear in a human being. It can, appear, it can be invisible. It can inhabit a human being in invisible form, and yet it will express itself physically and then the actions of an enlightened human being. And when you encounter, if you should be fortunate enough to encounter real, real strength, your first reaction is bewilderment. The words are strange, the manner is strange, the ideas are strange, the whole atmosphere is strange, and you don't quite to make, don't quite know what to make of it. And so you sit back and watch, oh, excuse me, you sit back and crouch, crouch, ready to pounce, ready to catch a mistake, ready to find something to criticize, finding something to sneer at, something to hate, because this is all you can do. All you know to do is to hate. Listen, please. All you know to do is to hate anything that is unlike your own present degenerate state. Plain, clear, right? No problem there. All you can do is hate it because real strength, God, yes, God, reality, truth, is a threat to your phoniness, which you call reality. 
So it's a, a very interesting experience, and I'm sure that many of you here in this room and listening to this tape more or less know what I'm talking about because all of you came to this class for the first time. And parts of you, the lost parts of you, the largely lost parts, 99 to 9 tenths, had the very experiences and reactions that I'm talking to you about now. That is, you never heard anything like this before. That is the truth, and it's not my truth. It's God's truth. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to you, except as we want it and live within it as a whole, not claiming the truth as an individual feature. So you came here, and then you made your decision. And I'm speaking not only of those of you who are here now, but those who came and left. Everybody comes here, and at first they're baffled. And then the bewilderment gradually turns to hostility, to self-defense, and to childish reactions, childish wishes for revenge, fearful desires to protect yourself, you don't even know what you're protecting. I know what some of you are thinking. I can see the string of your eyes, by the way. You don't even know what you're protecting. You don't even know, know that you're protecting your own degeneracy, which is ripping you apart, which is making you miserable. And so I have to say to anyone in this state, there is such a thing as intelligence. And one way in which this true intelligence can operate, and an explanation for it, which exists, an explanation for it, instead of letting your old nature take over and attack and defend. So it's always a crisis, always a crisis to anyone who comes to any of these meetings to hear a talk, to join in the discussion, because you don't know what to do with it. You don't know how to think toward it. When you were down at that uh, club you belonged to, that social organization, and they had a meeting, or you sat around in a group discussion of some kind, you knew how to behave perfectly. Very easy. Someone would make a remark about politics or religion or about economics, about education, something like that. You had no problem in contributing your brilliance to the overall intelligence of the meeting. Well, if we raise taxes, that will help. Well, if we lower taxes, that will help. In other words, we have mastered, you have mastered the art of lying in your sleep. I you see, this doesn't take any effort. This doesn't take any work at all. You just sit back and tell your usual stream of lies and protecting yourself by lying about the fact that you're lying. In other words, I'm not lying. I'm contributing something to the group, to mankind, or to my family for that matter. But here, when you come here, you're baffled, and there's no way you can get out of it. Not while here. That is, the atmosphere of this room will not permit you to get away with what you get away with among your stupid friends, among your fellow liars down at the club, down at the society. And that is where the hostility begins. Am I giving a biography of some of you, perhaps? Huh? Yeah, sure. That's where the hostility begins. Because when you chirped up to give your marvelous, boring 15-minute speech down at the club, and everyone wishes you'd sit down and shut up, but you don't even have brains enough to do that. You think you're wowing them. Instead, you're putting them to sleep. When you stood up and gave that little talk down there, you felt important. You felt that you were contributing something. 
and you never noticed how bored they were with you because all the while you were talking in your sleep, excuse me, lying in your sleep, another part of you became the audience. You were both the actor and the audience. You provided your own built-in applause. And the audience, every once in a while, they'd give a little laugh maybe, and you thought you were doing marvelous. So when you're with your sick friends, you're equally your friends who are as degenerate as you are, it becomes a conspiracy of evil, which both you and your friends just wallow in. It's marvelous. We have no problems as long as we lie to each other. Everything is beautiful. And you go out of there feeling important. And as you drive over the bridge going home, you wonder whether you should stop and get out of the car. Right? right. So aren't you delighted that when you come here that you're not allowed to get away with your usual pack of lies? which you don't even know you're doing. You see, it's hard work here. I have to work hard here myself. I have to find all kind of little devices, low-level devices, because that's all you can comprehend, little low-level devices to try to get over to you that not only are you degenerate liars, but you have no idea that you are. Me? Not me. Maybe the woman next to me. Maybe the man next to me. So you see, it's very hard work to try to get us to the point where we see the actual state we're in. And when you're sitting here right now this morning, turn your attention back to yourself. And all of you watch, some of you to one degree uh, than another, I know that. Watch how stiff you are. Watch how you don't know how to act. And watch how, if you know how to act, you're afraid to do it, for afraid you'll get knocked down, and you will. There's a, a marvelous difference in this group than in all the groups you've ever attended before in your life, which is this. You are a big phony. You've always been a phony. You're cruel. You don't know how to act in the act decently in the slightest situation. Some of you don't even have good manners right here in this room. This is the way you are. Now, can you begin to show one small spark of intelligence and begin to investigate your state? instead of attacking someone on the outside, which is your usual, your habitual and dreadful self-punishing way of solving your conflicts up to this time. This is all you've known is to fight, right? Find someone to hit. That's your level of morality. Listen to me. That is your level of decency. Who can I smack? You don't think you say that? I am telling you that you say that. That's how vicious you are. Some of you don't even have brains enough to be grateful for being told that you're an animal. You don't even have gratitude enough to see that you're being told the truth about yourself. And if you can take that, if you will bear that, if you can endure that, after taking that, you can then be told the truth about God and eternity, not in reverse order. If we come here and talk about God and eternity first, then that's the grand cover-up in which billions of human beings engage in every Sunday and every other day of the week. We start with the fact that you and I are in terrible, terrible shape and we don't know what to do about it. Here you will learn what to do about it, which is to see the actual condition you're in by little jolts as much as you can take at a time. Then we begin to, 
to do this preliminary work, an, an added preliminary work, which is to not identify with what you see in yourself, you are degenerate now because that's all you have, that's all you are, so you are indeed degenerate. We're telling you that if you see this, understand that, and no longer love to be sick, you see, you love to be sick or you wouldn't be. This is your fondness. This is your great, great love to be in a state of illness. If you can begin to see that this is the state you're in, then the next lesson can begin because now you're beginning to acquire spiritual hearing, spiritual receptivity, which you don't have much of right now. All you have now is a tight little closed eyes of protecting yourself against anything that doesn't flatter you, that doesn't agree with you. Then indeed you can be told about something that will rescue you from your own unconscious mechanical flow. And you can't do it yourself. You can't save yourself. There's no point trying. What you can do is understand that you can't save yourself. And with that understanding, then all effort, mechanical effort to do that falls away, which leaves the blank space, which enables God, truth, reality, to begin to operate, to save you, to do what you can't do for yourself. Now life becomes beautiful. Now life becomes very peaceful. Now you, ha listen, can you conceive such a thing as I'm going to say next, or does it scare you? What's your reaction to what I'm going to say? Then you have no problems at all. That scares you, doesn't it? Yes, it scares you, because you wouldn't know what to do with yourself without your gripes, without your targets, without people to blast at. You'd get scared without having something to do that is the usual doing. We're telling you here in this room that if you go through all of this, if you have the a courage or have no courage at all to simply listen and sit back, then you will be saved. Then you will know a life, a world that's not that's not a part of this fearful need to fight everything and to fight everyone, which you are now doing. You don't even have to protect yourself anymore because there's no one there to protect. How beautiful. How beautiful to not have someone there to protect or promote. That's a beautiful life. Now I'll tell you a little story. Once upon a time there was a man who was degenerate, who was sick. And he didn't know what to do about it. So he decided the thing to do about it would be to set traps for other people. Just set traps for them. And he found out that when he set traps for other people, men, women, old, young, anybody, that it was very easy for people to fall into his traps. For example, suggesting that they do certain work that he want done and uh, make them feel guilty if they didn't do it. We've had lessons on that, haven't we? Setting all kind of little verbal traps, uh, action traps for other people, uh, of various kinds in order to get them to confirm his idea that he had power in this world. And people fell for it left and right. He met a woman who fell for it. He met other men who fell for it. And he got all that he wanted from him. He met voters who fell for it. So he was a trap setter. And this was his life. But you know, he found out that it took a lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of weariness to go around setting traps for other people in order to make himself feel good. And he found out, curiously, that out of every hundred traps that he set out, for, he himself stumbled into fifty of them. He was trapped by his own traps. For example, he discovered that every time he became angry at someone, wanting to get them in the trap, that it was his own trap because he felt every time he burst out in hostility, he began to notice something that he'd never noticed before. Every time he became hostile, he lit a fire inside himself. And he further noticed 
that that fire burned him. And he could feel the pain of the burning. So he said to himself, if I stop setting traps, I'll, ne I'll neither fall in on myself, but on the other hand, I won't get what I called my benefits from other people. For example, give them flatter to the flattery and they flatter me back. I won't get from other people what I usually get if I cease to set traps. But on the other hand, I won't fall in myself. So it was a pretty confused situation. So he went a little further than that and said the following. What if I forgot entirely about both the rewards and the punishments of setting out traps, cease to think in the terms of the opposites of rewards and punishments, and just cease to set traps altogether, being non-critical to people. Remember last night? Not set the trap of being critical to people. That would certainly be a new experience, it'd certainly be something that I couldn't figure out ahead of time. Therefore, I'm just going to have to cease to go around setting the traps, making critical remarks, trying to trick people, being phony with them. I'm going to have to stop all that just to see what happens to me as a result. I do know for sure two things, that if I flatter you, you're not going to flatter me back because I'm not going to flatter you anymore. That trap is not going to be sent. I also know that I'm not going to get hurt by the traps either. So he went further and ceased to set out the traps. And to his astonishment, he found a state in which he saw quite clearly, without any doubt at all, that every single day of his previous life had been spent in vain, been spent foolishly, been spent unnecessarily trying to find something, happiness, which he could have had instantly, right now, had he understood what he understood right now. And you would think, maybe, that when he saw the happiness derived from not thinking in opposites, that at first he would have great pain and regret over the 70 years, we'll make him a 70-year-old trapper, you would think that he would go into great pain and regret and say, I lived 70 years on this earth, and I wasted every one of them except the last week when I saw clearly, without any doubt, what I am all about, what truth is all about, what life is all about. You would think he would do that. But you would, you would think he was doing that only if you were thinking from his previous level instead of his present level, which means there's no such thing as a past life. There's no such thing as a wasted 70 years. There's no such thing anymore as these as 70 years of self-torment and hurting himself and hurting other people. All that is gone because time is gone. There's, therefore, there can be no regret. If there's regret, he wouldn't be in the happiness because regret is tied to time, tied to torment. You, you follow... Yes, no. See, when time exists, you, when, when time no longer exists, you disappear. Therefore, you disappear as that person who blundered for 70 years. That All that goes, at, what is the beauty of it? This is what heaven is, to not live in time. Therefore, not in regret over past mistakes. When religious literature says God will heal all hurts it is stating a very accurate and a very beautiful fact isn't it you may not know it yet but I will tell you that it's a beautiful fact which you can find out for yourself 
So the man found his way out, and I'm going to do some reading for you now, and then we'll have a break. And you will please write down the following. Just a few words. Beware of the yap trap. That makes sense without explanation, right? Beware of the yap trap. And I will give you very specific instructions for bewaring of the yap trap. And uh, I'll give you one guess as to where the yap trap exists in two places. Two places. One place out there, the other one in me. Oh, you. <laughs> I thought I'd see what happens as a result of that. All right. Uh, you won't be able to write this down, I don't think, but they'll be given to Stella afterward, and she'll make a copy if you want it. I'll read it twice, slowly. This is you speaking to the world out there and in here. But for the present, we're going to put our attention on the world out there. Okay? You are speaking to the exterior world, to people out there. And out of these words will develop a cosmic philosophy that you can live from that will be far more than these mere words. Your anxiety belongs to you. It does not and cannot belong to me. I need not feel responsible for it. Try to ease your pain from it. Feel guilty over it. Converse with you about it. Give my attention to it. Feel sympathetic toward you over it. Be anxious toward it. React with confusion toward it. Be burdened by it. Get involved in any way with it. Your anxiety belongs to you. It does not and cannot belong to me. If you still have a bit of the Savior in you, you'll be reluctant to accept this. Please get rid of the Savior in you. I'll read it once more. You're speaking to other people, maybe in your family. Your anxiety belongs to you. It does not and cannot belong to me. I need not feel responsible for it, try to ease your pain from it, feel guilty over it, converse with you about it, give my attention to it, feel sympathetic toward you over it, be anxious toward it, react with confusion toward it, be burdened by it, get involved in any way with it. Conclusion. Your anxiety belongs to you. It does not and it cannot belong to me. Amen. Amen. Let's take a break. <laughs> will be added to those you get tomorrow if you've ordered them. Three more very powerful thoughts. Anger, whether suppressed or expressed, always tells lies. Anger, whether suppressed or expressed, always tells lies. Second one. Talk about beauty. Uh, roses and moonlight can't compare to what you're going to hear next. Moonlight and roses can't compare. To what you know. I am not required to sacrifice my life to your weakness. I am not required to sacrifice my life to your weakness. Finally, I am not, uh, I'll read the other one again. I am not required to sacrifice my life to your weakness. Finally, 
You no longer have a good opinion of me. Hooray. <laughs> One more trap is smashed. You no longer have a good opinion of me. Hooray. One more trap is smashed. Get it done. All right. Some of you can't come tomorrow on Sunday when you are active in <coughs> speaking before the group. So let me see the hands of those of you who would like to give your little Sunday talks on Saturday. Yes, please. What did I do wrong yesterday, uh, last, last night? What did you do wrong? Yeah. Your whole life is wrong. Everything you do is wrong. A man or a woman walking in their sleep does everything wrong by bumping into everything. Everything you do is wrong. And notice that I turn my attention that way as well as that way when I said it. What enormous vanity. There are 50,000 things for me to do in life, and one of them is wrong. Specify it for me. Yeah. 50,000 wrongs. No rights. A sleeping human being can only do wrong to himself and everybody he bumps into. He hurts the other person he bumps into, and he gets bruised himself. Just a minute. Have you criticized these meetings or me to your father? Constructive criticism. I instruct you to not listen to any criticism your son makes while you're here. That's an order, not a request. Don't you put up with it. three stages. The first stage is beloved agony. The second stage is blankness. The third stage is no agony. Clear? Not clear? See, when you're in the second stage, you can't, you can't hang on to your agony, and yet you don't know what non-agony is, and this is very, very fearful intensely fearful go ahead and do it anyway you'll come out on the other side I will guarantee you that that's one guarantee I'll make you if you will do your work did I see a hand yeah. yes I just wanted to make a statement that of all the traps I have found myself in and I put myself in the worst in the rejection is when I go up to talk to someone, and it's very apparent here in the class with certain people, yeah. and they will not respond, and the fear and the trembling that starts in me, and I'm never really sure whether where they're coming from or where I'm coming from, and in a few seconds it gets all mixed up. Once in a great while I'm conscious enough, awake enough, that I can see their fear is so large that this is the only way they can have control over me in the situation is to get this hard look, this hard mask, you know, not even a, a social hello, and then go on the way. Oh, yes. They're your best friends. Yes, they're good. Sure. sure. And do you thank them? It's good are you Are you courteous no, enough I'm to thank them? <laughs> 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 oh yes, that's marvelous. I'm, it happens all the time. Good morning, let's do. possibly do that. We, we love them. How can we hate them? We 
it takes a very long time to come to the realization that the sleeping state is such gross agony, and that is all you have to give, that that is in itself hatred and not only contributes to their demise, yes. but the misery of all mankind. Yes, very good, very clear. You may make comments like that if you wish, or ask questions, either one. Paul. <coughs> it seems important to examine everything that you say in this, to us as a class and everything that is said. Important to examine it and try to see if it is at all in our lives, you know, in my life. If anything is actually there that you're talking about. For instance, if if I do criticize a lot, I can verify that by the fact that I see it because you told told that to us. Because what? You told it to us. You told us to look for it and then I can see that well that actually is there. Okay. And that's a right connection. That's a right thing. Well, follow right instructions is right, of course. How about all of us uh, being here right now? No, no five seconds ago, that has no effect on the way we can be right now. Not five seconds or 50 years ago. Right here, free right now. Would you speak loud, please? I spoke of criticism last night, and it took me too long to see this, but I found that my very uh, enthusiastic response to Alan's remark last night, which I saw as positive, was in fact criticism of the gentleman that he was addressing. He, not, his remark was not criticism. My response I was... I see, yes. And also, was there a little anxiety in you? Yeah. Yes, right. Well, uh, let me tell you something. Let me tell you how this class is different. You'll understand what I'm going to say. We are lovers of anxiety. We invite it. All right, we'll take that as a comment, Duffy. Uh, Alicia. Going to a walk this morning, I was watching myself. And mentally, I caught myself about ten times criticizing or uh, what's the, the project of the class to work out. To watch yourself criticize uh, how often you do and to not do it. Mentally, about ten times. Yeah, sure. All right, how many of the rest of you are, are working on this exercise you were given? Now, hands of those who are not. <coughs> you weren't here. Were you here last night? No. Good excuse. I've been too obsessed to. Go ahead. Well, I'm going to say that you want to give a talk? Or you're going to be here tomorrow, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, that's right. Go but ahead, make a comment. When I uh, when I thought about it after I got home, I thought, God Almighty, I'll need to read the paper. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. Daphne, you had your hand up. Yeah, the criticism, I don't catch it right at the moment. Usually I catch it at least 10 minutes later. <laughs> Another attendant at the class came. That's for uh, another attendant at the class came by, and I think Pat may have seen the same thing. I saw me criticize him, we criticized the other person, and there was fear in both of us. Just within a second, within a second. Machine gun, right? It, it 
appears to me that there are other criticisms that we make that are subconscious and that we're not even aware of. And when the degree of awareness begins to expand, we become aware of even our subconscious motives. It begins to come up. That's what it's all about, to see what we're really like inside. painful when you see yourself as you are and you don't want to see it and you'll lie about it and you'll sneer and do everything childish and idiotic. Go ahead, keep looking, and after a while you're doing it. And the reason you're doing it is to get rid of the hell within. Now, doesn't it make perfect sense to get rid of the hell inside instead of lying about it? Besides, in this room, your lies are as clear as the wall. This is something I hated in other people, and I did it myself. I would say, now this is constructive criticism, and then I would go to town on it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was, I didn't know how venomous. I was doing it right, but if someone else did it to me, it was the same phrase. Oh, yes, yes. Phony phrases. Along with what Joan said, usually we all preface it by saying, and this is for your own good that right. I'm telling you. <laughs> right. What Phyllis was talking about, I sometimes sense by the fact that I'm carrying around hostility inside of me. Very hostile. And it points kind of, well, why should I be hostile? You know, I must. And then after thinking about it, well, I must hate it. You know, I must be mad at somebody for something. And that's what creates the hostility. All right. A uh, Phyllis. Uh, yes, going back to criticism, we also have to sense the difference between criticizing and stating a fact, like if I would walk over to someone and say, who had done work for me and say, look, there were three mistakes, please be careful. If this is an empirical thing, I mean, I see it, it's a fact. It's not criticism, I'm pointing something out. Isn't it curious that we can indeed begin to look at ourselves and use the word sick, I'm very sick inwardly, say I'm very sick without it being a criticism simply a fact you know the best and old familiar illustration you go to the doctor and you've got a, a migraine headache the doctor doesn't hate your headache he doesn't say that's a terrible thing for you to how immoral for you to have a, it is by the way because it comes from other sources right you can see that. <laughs> And he doesn't tell you to hate your headache. If you go home hating your headache, there's something wrong with your head. <laughs> but scientifically, I have a headache. Now, from that fact, intelligence can begin to work on it. You can take a pill or quit hating somebody. A phenomenal thing about this, this class and this teaching is that take a man and a woman that live together uh, they they have a fight, and what they can do in a new way is explore why the whole thing happened, so that it, so it can so that they can do something about it happening again. And uh, the the rest of the world doesn't want this. Right. And do you know there is such a thing? This is, has its right place. What I'm going to tell you, but it's a part of the whole picture. Who started the fight? Who started the fight? Now, the other person may be equal guilty by continuing the fight. But I'm asking you, who started the fight? Now, if I started it, I can take my responsibility. I'm the one who led that other person astray by him or her getting mad too by me starting it. I can take my responsibility for starting the quarrel. Criticism, a negative emotion. Just Which kind are you talking about? Which kind? <laughs> yeah, I w see. We have the word. We have the word problem. Self-centered criticism is always a negative state, right? 
What if it's understanding criticism? You, you know, when I, when I call you sickies and super sickies, I'm not criticizing you. I'm stating facts. I'm not criticizing. I really am not. I'm stating a fact. You're sick. Whose mind said, well, what about you? <laughs> Don't you dare ask. <laughs> Murray. A while ago you said that in this class we welcome, was it anxiety? Yeah. Right? Sure. I thought, I thought about something that I saw written somewhere that said, not around, but through. Okay. Uh, write down a sentence. From now on, my favorite waltzing partner will be anxiety. <laughs> From now on, yes, yes, no. from now on, <laughs> well, we had hostility out in the open, no? from now on, my favorite waltzing partner will be anxiety. Haven't you men ever waltzed with a girl and you got to know all about her while waltzing to Moonlight and Roses? Huh? You got acquainted with her and you knew how to handle her? By the way. I have, I have our class song. I now assign our class song, which is Moonlight and Neuroses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The reason you don't criticize, or the reason your criticism isn't criticism, is because there is no I behind it. You are simply saying what you see clearly. That is correct. Excellent statement. Yes, I was just thinking that when you criticize, you actually see something. But when I criticize, I simply take something that I'm holding within myself and project it on myself. Projection, yes. I don't criticize children or older people. I look for someone that is to my level or up there to my level so I can get some anxiety as a response. Yes, right. Um, I don't understand this phrase. My favorite waltzing partner will be to fight anxiety is to recreate it every second. When you're waltzing with it, you're not fighting, you are exploring, you're talking, you're understanding, you're getting familiar. The one thing anxiety can't stand is for you to waltz with it so long without resistance that you understand its non-power. How'd you like that dip in my voice, non-power? Pardon? Resist not evil. Right, of course. There she said it. Not only with anxiety, but with other little habits throughout our life, which are always the same, like little chores in the house with drivers. Eventually, on little ones, I begin to see their pattern, how I get caught in the trap again. And on some of the occasions, I see right through them, and they're not my enemy anymore. They don't cry me anymore. Okay. I'm their master. Okay, fine. Hands, please. Joan. I don't know if this is true of every boy. It's been true of me. That in one area, I was a bully. I could intimidate people. I was cruel. I could make them cry. I could hurt them terribly. People who were weaker than I was. In another area, I was the intimidated and the one who was me. So the thing is, my whole life was has been a pattern of hurt over there and get hurt over here. Correct. Now I see it as cause and effect also. Yeah. And I would assume that it works this way in men and women. Everybody, all of us, yes. There's a part of all critical people that takes great pride in being critical. Oh, yes. He's proud of it. 
Listen to this great man talking who has the answer. I found that uh, if I were to voice every criticism and uh, dissatisfaction that went on in my mind, I would talk continually. <laughs> and if I were to voice to another person the things that I say to myself, just like one other person in one day's time, that person would probably kill me. Yeah, sure. The kind of things that I say to myself. Sure. Jim. One of the most difficult reasons why we have a difficulty in accepting these teachings is because the mind is always thinking in terms of beginning and ending. And we're trying to figure it out, and there is no way to figure it out because every time I see a question that I want to ask, and then I look at it and I can see that there is anxiety related to it, and there is no answer. Uh, for example, a person listening say, well, who's the cause of all this anxiety, all the hatred, all the stupidity, all the frustration in man? And God created everything. Did he, is he not responsible for this? So we're thinking in terms of cause, I mean, beginning and ending, not seeing it. It's all an illusion in our mind. Yes, yes. Cause and effect is transcended by cosmic consciousness. When children get up or wake up, how can you help them to enter in their life's sleep? Answer. You know what I'm going to answer. You might as well say it yourself. Go ahead. Work on yourself. Be an example. What kind of example are you to your children? really meant a person like you, for instance. How could, could you help I, I'm sorry, I don't follow your point. Try again, and okay. we'll work on it. Okay, I, I know that I cannot help children okay. from entering in their life sleep. Okay. But how a person like yourself, for instance, could help? Oh, oh, by working on myself, first of all, so that I have something authentic to give anyone who comes here. Amy. Is instant recovery from a happy or pleasurable experience as important as recovering from a negative experience? Oh, it's cancellation of all experiences. All experiences are in time. All experiences connect with I. I'm excited because I got the gold medal. I'm depressed because I didn't get the gold medal. When you cancel time, you're above both winning and losing the medals and free and right now. You try, you try to escape sorrow without uh, escaping pleasure sorrow. It can't be done. You want to remember how you won the medal, but want to forget how you lost the medal. Can't be done, can it? You have to go above uh, a memory identification of both winning the medal and losing the medal, which means the end of you as a medal acquirer, which is freedom. <coughs> Right. Pleasure and pain always go together. Correct. Both have to be given up. Quite right. Tom. Uh, in all of our daily activities, the hardest thing to do is to be an example of of what you of what you know or what you have become, and not to try to preach it. That's the hardest thing in the world. Right. right. As far as pleasure and pain are concerned, what has to be given up is not the fact of it. But the identification with it. If there is pleasure present or pain pleasant, and I lie about it and say it is not present because I have given it up, that is a trap of tremendous proportion. If I simply see it as something that's coming and going and not me, then I'm free of it, whether it's there or not there. Well, if you are saying to think I am free is not to be free, that is correct. Murray. Getting back to waltzing with anxiety, you told us over and over again that to understand is to be free. Correct. Then to understand actually is what 
when we get tired enough and give up. I, I'm telling you, those two words, you'll never find more, two more valuable words than give up. If you want to add one more to make it clearer, if that isn't clear to you, give up fighting. You're fighting to preserve an illusion about yourself, but you don't see this. You are absolutely hardened in your conviction that the you you think about is real and it isn't. And you're going to knock your head against that brick wall until you begin to see this. I guarantee you, you're going to be scared, you're going to be hateful, you're going to be critical, you're going to be stupid. Oh no, are you going to be scared until you have the courage to listen to something that is not a part of your memory, not a part of your past, not a part of your self-structure. Begin to listen to something that is different, that is new. Do it in a small way at the start. That's all you can do anyway. All we're asked to do here is to start. God will do the rest if you'll let him. It's our willingness that permits God to start to work on us in a different way. And you don't know, by the way, any of you yet, that God exists. You're still atheists, worshiping your own self, which you call God, <coughs> worshiping your own neurotic ideas, which are your gods. And you pray to those gods, and they answer your prayers, and they give you the sickness that you ask for, that you pray for. They give you the fear and the tension that you pray for. They give you the phoniness that you pray for. We have five more minutes. The first step is the last step. All right. None time being involved. How deep inside that vicious circle we are. How how so barely your words or the truth reaches into. Yes, I I know that. Our present gods demand our inner peace and integrity as a sacrifice. S say that again, please. Our inner gods demand our inner peace as a sacrifice to man. Yes. Okay, sure. You all know we'll be at Leland's tomorrow, don't you? You all know where that is. Please. I don't know exactly where it is. Someone tell him after the meeting. I'll assign Pat tell him <clears throat> how to get there. It's a residence. Brennan, you tell us we're degenerate. False personality reacts to that and says, oh, oh no, not me, I'm your, I'm your star. Then we don't see the connection when we go home, we belittle and intimidate and insult and act viciously toward all of those in our lives. We don't see that that's what you were just telling us. Uh, can you give me a worse word than degenerate, a lower one? Give me another. How about depraved? Depraved. That's not bad. Can you get a lower one than that? <laughs> Snake. <laughs> Cobra. Scum. <laughs> good thing there aren't. It's a good thing there aren't any Christians in this room. Oh, you know, we've used them all. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to invent some new insults. When you repeat, when you say the words, it doesn't seem to mean much. You know, when you just say them. But if you can start to connect them, that I actually am depraved, then it has a value. But something else is also happening in this room which you may not be aware of. When I tell you you're depraved, I know that those of you who have been here for some time also understand that there's 
equally with insulting you by calling you depraved is a lesson in which I am saying something completely contradictory to it in which I say you are not depraved. Now you have to go to work to figure that out, don't you? So you have till tomorrow to figure it out. Good <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.